thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, unfortunately, I can't stay the whole week, but I'm looking forward to today and tomorrow. Or I enjoyed today. I'm looking forward to tomorrow very much. Um, so I'm going to attempt to sort of give a talk where I put a few details on the slides, but I'm going to also draw on the, uh, on the board. So I think if you, if you, what I'm drawing on the board should be on the more understandable sides if the slides are too, too technical, but feel free to interrupt. Um, and so to set the stage, I, uh, I want to talk about constant mean curvature surfaces. And so I don't, hopefully it's, since it's such a big deviation from what we had this morning, uh, I want to just define the basics. So, can you read that? Is that okay? Is that okay? So, the isoparametric problem is sort of a very old geometric problem in various guises. So what we're going to mean by the isoparametric problem is that you say that a set omega in a, man in a Riemannian manifold, say, is going to be isoparametric if So a set is going to be called isoparametric if it has the least area, the boundary area, for all regions of the same volume. So I wrote n, but really for today you can set n equals 3. So in a 3-manifold, you, you, when I say volume and area, then it makes, then everything is, is fine. So you want, you want to enclose a fixed amount of volume with the least area. Okay? And I'm just going to ignore any issues of, issues of regularity, of which there are many, and it's a quite interesting story, but not for today. And so um, what I wanted to talk about today has to do with critical points for this variational problem. So you can ask for the global minimum, but also you can ask for just a, a first order critical point. That means that to first order the set minimizes the area for fixed volume. And you can also ask that to second order it minimizes area. Okay. And so what I'm going to say is, is a surface is constant mean curvature. So a surface is going to be a, a first-order critical point if it has constant mean curvature. The mean curvature is just the trace of the second fundamental form. Um, and st stability, I won't write it down, but I won't write down the condition. Okay, and so stability can be measured along the boundary of the surface. So I'll always write. The boundary is sigma, and so it turns out that you're a second order stable, you're a second order critical point for the isoparametric problem, if and only if you have the following inequality for all functions with mean zero. Okay, so here a will be the second fundamental form squared, and so um, this condition that that you require that phi to have mean zero, that's like saying that you preserve the enclosed volume, and now you're asking that you don't, you can't decrease the area. While, while enclosing a fixed volume, to second order at least. Okay. Is that okay? Are we, are we good till there? So I just mean that Okay, let me write this over here. So, yeah, so, so just omega, if, if you have any family of surfaces, with this being the original one, and I I want a fixed volume, then 
then I just want that the derivative at, at time equals 0 is 0. OK, and then similarly, when I say second order, I want a non-negative second derivative at, at time 0. OK, and so um, the study of constant mean curvature surfaces is, is in sort of geometric analysis setting, I think. Um, and it, in the set, in the, for the isoparametric problem, that's a very old problem. And more recently, people have studied sort of just the critical points. And so you have the following uniqueness results. So if you have an embedded compact constant mean curvature surface in R3, then it must be a round sphere. So that's proven by Alexandrov. And there, now there's some other proofs as well. Um, if it has genus 0, even if it's an immersed, then it's still it must be a round sphere. Um, and finally, if it's stable, then it's also, also a round sphere. So in particular, along with sort of an existence result for the parametric problem, this tells us that because in order to find the minima, we found critical points, right? So in particular, the isoparametric problem in the Euclidean space, the solution is the round, the round ball, right? So the round ball enclosing a fixed area, has, enclosing a fixed volume, has the least surface area among any such set. Okay? So that, that statement was known before these. You can do it, it directly by, by a more sort of symmetrization techniques, or you can sort of classify the critical points and use an existence result for isoparametric regions. And so. Um, if you've taken a sort of a, a course in, in Riemannian geometry where you do, you go beyond just the definition of, of, of curvature, once you start to look at what does it mean to have certain sorts of curvature, you learn that, that Ricci curvature is a thing that controls volume. Think, right? That's sort of the fundamental property of Ricci curvature, at least for me. If you're a Kähler geometer, maybe you don't agree with me. But so for, for comparison geometry, really volume is coming with, is related to Ricci curvature. Okay, so Bishop Gromov. There's also some very, uh, I think you don't learn this in your first Riemannian geometry class, but it turns out Ricci curvature and the isoparametric problem have sort of an obvious link. You can give some easily bound way the isoparametric regions behave by knowing something about the Ricci curvature. Okay. Um, and so uh, what I wanted to talk about instead is sort of the scalar curvature. So just in case. You don't remember the scalar curvature will be the trace of the Ricci curvature, which is itself the trace of the sectional curvature, the trace of the correct appropriate sectional curvatures, the curvature tensor. And so. Um, you start looking at examples of manifolds with various sectional curvature or scalar curvature behavior, you start to realize that you don't expect to be, have too strong of a, con a control on, on area and volume for scalar curvature. Okay, so sort of the things that are true for, for Ricci curvature is definitely not to be true for scalar curvature. Well, it's, it's, it's a much weaker condition. And so, however, it turns out that for small volumes, so if you're interested in very small regions, scalar curvature does play a certain role. Okay, so let me draw, try to draw a picture. And so, so what my picture is supposed to be is you're supposed to imagine a, a compact manifold where the scalar curvature has a, has a maximum at this point. Okay, so. Okay. And so what it turns out is that the, the point where the scalar curvature is the largest is where the small isoparametric regions turn out to concentrate. Okay, so I think there was a blue. So if I ask on this, in this manifold, how do I enclose 0 0.0001 volume with the least area, I'm going to do something like, like this. And so, he, so you don't know anything about where these regions are for large volumes. I can't say anything. 
Well, it may be an, in a rotationally symmetric example, you could say something. But for very small volumes, that answer is actually very simple, is that isoparametric regions, and actually more generally stable CMC regions, like to concentrate around points of maximal scalar curvature or locally maximal scalar curvature if it's stable, the stable CMC problem. Okay? And um, I'll just point out that there's, there's a big difference in the stable CMC case and the isoparametric case, because let's say this was the, the global maximum, but this was a local maximum. If this is the local maximum, you could find st stable CMC surfaces which were not isoparametric, okay? So stable CMC surfaces just feel the effect nearby, but to be isoparametric, you have to really beat every other surface, okay? Because that's like being a global minimum versus a, a local minimum. And so the, the real key to this sort of result is that on small scales, Riemannian manifolds look flat, okay? And so it turns out that when you start to study this problem, the scalar curvature is telling you what's the deviation from flatness in a certain sense. That's a very vague explanation, but the, the reason that scalar curvature can control the area and volume is because of the additional input of flatness in some sense. That's sort of a vague explanation. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is you take this problem as an idea, you say, okay, I sort of understand the behavior of these sorts of questions for manifolds which are flat on small scales, and I, that, that lets me understand small regions. So then the question is, what about manifolds which are flat on large scales? And let me understand, look at large regions. Okay, and so um, these sorts of examples have sort of a completely different story coming from general relativity, but I'm not going to start, I'm not going to tell that story at all, and I'll just tell it from the geometric point of view, okay? And so, um, for today, the key example of a manifold that's flat in some sense on large scales is, for me, going to be the Schwarzschild metric. And so the exact form of the metric is not so important, but what you should know is that it forms a family of rotationally symmetric scalar flat manifolds. And if you look at the metric, and so for me, bars are always going to be Euclidean. So the metric is going to be some conformal factor to the Euclidean metric, and for the, the, the distance from the origin very large, the conformal factor is going to go to one, right? So this metric, the Schwarzschild metric, as you go towards infinity, you go towards G bar. Okay, and there's some parameter here, M, uh, which has some, some physical meaning, it's called the mass, but for us, again, we can just think of it as just a parameter describing these metrics. When m is zero, you get Euclidean space. Okay. And so it turns out, there's also, a, a, there's a long story relating scalar curvature in this number m, but it turns out that m will always be positive. Otherwise, the metric is not going to be well behaved in the compact part. Okay. And so it's going to turn out that not only does scalar curvature have an effect, but also the mass m is going to have an effect on the positioning of large isoparametric and CMC regions. Okay. And so what I wanted to talk about today, now that we're sort of to the, the real topic, is so what happens to large stable CMC surfaces if you're asymptotic to the Schwarzschild metric? So that means that I'm going to consider man, like manifolds with metrics, which are this Schwarzschild metric, which is like Euclidean plus some correction, and then I'm going to allow some either even a further correction to, to perturb things a bit. So you're not, the, the manifold, the, the metrics will not be exactly rotationally symmetric. And in the compact part of the manifold, you won't have any real control. So you can sort of imagine them as out here, they're looking roughly like this, but then there's something quite confusing going on, and you could have some, some boundary 
for me, for technical reasons, if you're an expert, I'm going to assume that boundary is minimal and there's no other mi cl closed minimal surfaces. And so, so for me, I, I cut the short shield at the, I cut it off here, and I don't worry anymore. And so um, the, the first result in this direction is proved by Hiskin and Yao. And Hiskin and Yao proved an existence result, and I'll later talk about a, a uniqueness result that they prove. And so what they prove is that, so in this manifold, it's not clear that you can find any CMC, large CMC regions, or large stable CMC, or isoparametric regions. Okay? So it turns out even the existence of the isoparametric region, you can try to fix the volume and minimize area. Even the, the existence for that problem is a bit difficult because you could have some loss of mass at infinity. Right? There's, there's some non-compactness to the problem. So you could have like a, this usual picture where a minimizer would rather just run off to infinity and in the limit there's nothing. Right? That's something you're, you're a priori worried about. Okay? So it's not even clear that there exist any CMC surfaces, nor clear that there exist any that you you know what they look like, but it turns out that, okay, there do exist stable CMC surfaces, and you know exactly what they look like. And I'll draw that here. Okay. Okay, so it turns out that you can find a foliation near infinity by stable CMC surfaces. Okay. And so notice in Euclidean space, if this was exact Euclidean space, this is easy. I just take very large balls, take bigger and smaller ones. But in Euclidean space, there's no uniqueness for those balls. So I could take a, a large sphere and move it a little bit, and it's also CMC with the same mean curvature and same area. Okay. Um, and what's going to be the question here is, is it true for these spheres? So what happens if you move these spheres a little bit? Can, you, can they remain CMC? Or what happens if you move them a lot? Can you find another one which is CMC? And it turns out the answer is going to be no. So that's what I'll come to next. So, but for the existence result, we do know that there are candidates for CMC surfaces. And so, and in some sense, they're centered, okay? So the, if you look at sort of what is the center of these spheres, obviously you're in a manifold, so it doesn't make sense, but you're nearly Euclidean in the region where the, the spheres are, and so you could define some sort of Euclidean center, and the Euclidean center is gonna be roughly the center of the manifold, whatever that means. So these spheres are not very far off, okay? So they enclose the center, and their center is roughly the center. And what I just said is going to be important for my, my description of the uniqueness the results. Okay, so the theorem that I wanted to talk about today is the following. So if you're asymptotically short shield in the sense that you're a perturbation of short shield, a lower order perturbation with six derivatives, who cares? Um, and you're, we'll assume that you have positive mass, because obviously if you're gonna prove a uniqueness theorem, you want to exclude Euclidean space. So Euclidean space has zero mass. That's just, there's no extra terms. So I want to add an extra term. So once you're not Euclidean space, then if your scalar curvature vanishes identically, then a large, stable, embedded CMC surface is here. Okay. So in particular, there's no... So there's no such surface, for example, over here that's large, stable CMC. Okay? Is that, are there any questions about? Uh... Yeah, so, so these are the only large, stable CMC surfaces in the, in the, in the manifold. Okay. And so um, you, you can't do anything, you can't have any hope besides saying things for large surfaces, and this is sort of like what I was talking about before with the small surfaces. You don't expect to understand the medium surfaces in such a manifold, 
because they could live entirely in the piece which is just compact, is, is, doesn't have anything to do with the Euclidean end. Okay, and so, um, what's that? So, um, if you, in Schwarzschild, if you, if you look at the doubled Schwarzschild, for example, then there are definitely extra CMC surfaces that you sort of don't expect. And so I don't know if there are large CMC surfaces you don't expect, um, but, you sort of, you don't imagine that surfaces that go, are allowed to go through the, the boundary, they, they could behave very, very poorly. And that, I mean, I guess that's not totally understood. So. This is sort of, this is sort of the, the smallest manifold in which to prove a uniqueness result, in some sense. So you, could try to, you could try to enlarge your manifold and prove a, different, a, a stronger uniqueness result. Okay, so, um, Again, for the experts, you, you, might, people, you might have assumed that this, has, this theorem is true if you say non-negative scalar curvature instead of zero scalar curvature, and that turns out to be false. So the, you can, I can construct an example with non-negative scalar curvature which violates this theorem. I could, I could change the hypothesis on the scalar curvature to a longer sentence, and then it would still be true, but it, there's no nice way of saying the exact hypothesis which what we can prove. Um, and so, again, if you try to weaken asymptotically Schwarzschild to asymptotically flat, so here we're sort of assuming a sort of asymptotics, if you try to do something slightly weaker, it's also false by these examples of Carlotto and Shane. Okay. And so, what I wanted to talk about for my remaining time is what goes into the uniqueness result. In particular, I should say what other people have done before me, because this builds on several of them a list of several results by other people. Okay. So, um, the, essentially the way the story goes is that people proved uniqueness results for these surfaces under various conditions on the surface. So you assume that you have a large stable CMC surface and it, and it satisfies X additional assumption, then it must lie in the, in the canonical foliation or then it does not exist, right? So, and then what we did was finish the last, the last list of, of conditions, and that, but you put everything together and you get a uniqueness result. Okay, so what Husky and Yao prove in their, their original paper is that if you're centered in a certain sense, if you're weakly centered, then you're, you lie in this foliation. Okay, so let me try to draw a picture of this. So, so what Yusuke and Yao were able to prove is that if you contain a ball of a certain size related to the mean curvature, then this picture is wrong and actually you're in the, fol in the canonical foliation, okay? And so this sort of assumption is essentially assuming something about the inner radius of the manifold compared to the, the mean curvature. Okay, and that, that will come back when I talk about what we've proved. Um, oh, sorry. And then this condition was subsequently weak it, weakened by Ching and Tian to just assume, to say that there exists a set which is very large, say, but fixed. And once you contain that set, then you're in the, in the foliation, okay? And so I'll, I'll, I'll say a word about how you might prove such a result in a minute, but let me just, let me go through the, uh, the um, results. And then, so we were able to shrink the set down to a point. So if you contain a point, then that's enough to force you into the, into the foliation any given point. If you contain a point and you're very large. So, but, but very large depends on the point. 
And so somehow, what, what we prove is that if you contain a point, then you eventually miss this compact. Like, what we prove is you eventually miss any comp given compact set. And so what the, these three results tell you is that if you have a counterexample to the uniqueness theorem, then you don't look like this, but you look like this. OK, so the sphere and its center are very far to one side. So I'll come back and talk about these, these guys in a minute. Okay, and so there's been several works related to this. And so um, what I wanted to talk about first is how do you sort of, how does such, you prove sort of these theorems. I'll be a bit brief here. But the general idea is the following quite simple identity, which is, Remember, for me, bars mean Euclidean, and no bars mean this other metric, OK? And so assume that you have a constant mean curvature surface sigma in your manifold. Okay? Then you, what you do is, is for, so for the Huskin yao or the Ching and Tian arguments, you're going to, the surface, of the, the surface will lie very far out in the manifold. So you can say, what's the difference between the Euclidean and the G mean curvature, OK? So it's quite a nice exercise um, in terms of how does mean curvature could change under conformal change. And then, because there's extra terms, you can add those in. So it turns out you can compute that the difference of the Euclidean and the G mean curvatures has something to do with this quantity m. And then there's this r to the minus 3 times an x dot the normal vector. Okay. And um, OK. So, but on the other hand, we have a funny way of getting 0. Okay. So both of these terms are going to give me 0. So what I'm going to do is I imagine the first term. This is like saying what happens to the, the Euclidean area when I move in a fixed direction A. So I'm, right, this is the first derivative of area if I just move the surface in a direction A. So for Euclidean space, that's a isometry. So that obviously doesn't change area. And if you work it out, the mean curvature times the speed along the normal speed, which is that, is, is going to be that first derivative. So that's the first term. The second term is just the divergence theorem, right? So if I integrate nu dot a over the boundary, I can use the Euclidean divergence theorem to bring it inside, and the divergence of a constant vector field is 0. Okay? So putting that together, I get that the integral of h bar minus h times this nu dot a is it has to be 0, precisely. Okay, so that's coming from, and there I've used the fact that you're CMC, right, to pull in the H, if, you, if you're paying attention. So that's sort of one of the only places you use it in an obvious way. In some other places, you'll use it in a more subtle way. And so if you assume that you have a sphere which has radius R and center R times a fixed vector, so that, that, that's sort of like saying that if you rescale the picture so it has radius 1, the center is A. Okay, so variant notion of center. And so what using this, this estimate for how the, uh, the mean curvature changes between the two metrics, what you can do is you, you have this thing which you know is 0. I don't know if you can see that. This thing you know is 0, but then you can compute it. Okay? And now here, if you're really bored, you can figure out how to compute this integral. And so you're, you're using here implicitly that sigma is quite round. And that's a sort of technical note. But it turns out that what pops out is A. Okay. So in some, what we find that A will be zero in order for you to be a quite round CMC surface. Okay. Is that clear? So the idea is to use this funny argument that I described before to, to have an integral which on one hand is zero, the other hand is the, the size of A in some sense. Okay. That tells you that you have to be centered. And then from there, you can use the implicit function theorem to tell you that you actually to lie in the foliation. You're, you're near in the foliation, so then you can, you can use something much sort of more basic in some sense. Okay. So, all right, there we go. Um, and so just one thing is that here, 
it turns out that the, the, the step from replacing sigma by the sphere is quite simple. Because some, some of these terms are a bit uh, singular, so there's like a r to the minus three term, and that, that could play poorly. So if you, if you don't have estimates on how, how spherical you are, this argument might not work. Okay. So, and Ching and Tian, what their contribution was, is they were able to improve the, this approximation technique, and that's, that, and, and Hu Yao had this, this additional assumption that the inner radius was somehow under control, and Ching and, Yan, Ching and Tian were able to handle the, the argument, even if the inner radius was not under control in a certain sense, okay? And so, then I'll be very brief here, but if the inner radius is not very large, then you need a sort of a different, different argument, and just, I'll just say, use an argument related to the positive mass there, okay? So I won't, I won't explain that. So, now to get sort of to the stage of what I want to talk about today is what we're left with, so I'll just, to recap, we use this sort of flux type argument, you compare Euclidean to G mean curvature, and you use this funny argument to show that if A, the center A was sort of, you're sort of centered, then you had to actually be in the, in the foliation. And so thus, the thing that's remaining is that you're really quite far out, okay? So you look like this. And so it turns out that you could try to run the same argument. You say, oh, I'll just check the same integral. But it turns out that the, these sort of flux integrals that you used before vanish. So you can show they vanish just by this funny, like, uh, first variation and divergence theorem argument. But then you get that, that it's equal to something in terms of A, but then you get that that's equal to zero, so you haven't proved anything. Okay. So you, the, the, the previous argument doesn't work for in, that, in that case, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, you, you get F of A, you know that F of A is equal to zero, and you'd like to say that implies A is zero. But if F of A is zero, that's, that's not. E zero for all A bigger than one in some sense. So you, you don't get any information. And so it turns out that that's not, su I mean, after the fact, that's not so surprising because there exist counterexamples. So it, the problem is now, in, for these guys, the scalar curvature and the mass play a sort of a, re a similar role, okay? In the previous results, the mass was, this quantity M was everything. But here now, the scalar curvature starts clawing its way back into the problem, and it turns out that if you just assume non-negative scalar curvature, you can construct, you can construct those guys. The, the double piece has a different problem, which is that they go through the compact part in a certain way. Um, is that the answer to the question? Okay. So um, it turns out that, that in some sense, these sorts of integrals can't work out. But if you do sort of a very careful, what's called Lyapunov-Schmidt analysis, in some way you can, you can rule, you can show that vanishing scalar curvature is enough to rule these out. So I also don't want to talk about that, because it's, it's uh, a bit hard to describe. Okay. But what it turns out is what you need is that for this sort of analysis to work, you need to know something about how the inner radius and the mean curvature behave. So mean curvature is usually like one over the radius, so for a sphere in Euclidean space. Mean curvature is one over r, two over r, depending on how you measure it, okay? And so this sort of theorem needs some sort of a priori input that the mean curvature and the inner radius are of the same size. So that's like saying that this distance and this distance, whatever that exactly means, which I'll write, say, 1 over h, that's another sort of way of measuring the radius of a, of a sphere, CMC sphere. This, this theorem needs that they're of the same size. Okay. So what's missing now is proving that they must be of the same size. Okay. And so that's what, that's the theorem that I, I wanted to finish by, by talking about. Okay. So under in the assumptions that we've been talking about, actually this theorem itself only needs not negative scalar curvature or whatever. We don't really talk about that. But you have this a priori estimate that says 
the, the inner radius, the distance to the sphere, and the mean curvature are roughly of the same size. It, it, you're not so worried about this being very large. You're worried about it being very small. So what you're worried about is that this sphere is getting very large, but drifting off very slowly. So it's like getting ver very large, but only drifting to infinity very, very slowly. And that, t that turns out to, to really hurt your, most of the analytic techniques that you have, because the error terms are just going to dominate, right? Because if you integrate something like 1 over r, maybe you bound that, when 1 over r cubed, you might end up trying to bound that by the inner radius, right? 1 over r is, is smaller than 1 over r naught, right? Because it, it, can, it only gets better far out. But then if that, if that term you don't understand, you have, you have a big problem. Okay. And so, um, yeah. So where's that u? Is it used? So, so this theorem is false if you don't assume asymptotic to Schwarzschild. Um, so, uh, which is asymptotically Schwarzschild. That's a stronger. So, I assume that I'm nearly Euclidean, but then the next term is m over r, and then I allow any any terms. And it's actually this isn't this is not true if you if you just assume. Yeah. And so. Um, Sort of the key input in the following theorem, which I think is, is one of my favorite, it's one of my favorite theorems, is that so if you have a stable CMC surface in a three manifold, then it turns out that you have the following relation between this integral of the mean curvature squared and some other terms, and these terms you can think of as just being non-negative. So we we're going to we're interested in scalar non-negative. This is a trace-free second final form. Just throw it away. It's, not, it's, it's a non-negative term. Okay? And that tells us that integral of h squared is smaller than 16 pi. Okay? And if you're, if you're good at computing things in Euclidean space, say, so for the round sphere in Euclidean space, the integral of h squared, if you've normalized it like I have, is exactly 16 pi. Okay? And so um, the proof some sort of conformal balancing argument, um, which appears in many related, related problems nowadays. Okay. Um, but what I just said is essentially this. So if, if you have any closed genus zero surface, then 16 pi minus integral h bar squared, so the Euclidean version of this term, is negative, right? So this is, this is related to the, the Wilmore inequality, not the most, not the recently proven Wilmore inequality, but sort of the classical Wilmore inequality, which says the L2 norm of the second, of H, like the integral of H squared in Euclidean space is always at least 16 pi, okay? And so the idea of the, the sort of, the estimate that I, let me bring the estimate back. The idea of this estimate to get somehow this, this estimate, you want to play these two things off each other. So obviously, this is not a contradiction, because the things which are positive and are negative are different, right? One is Euclidean, one is G. But we've seen that it's quite, quite a good idea to try to change the barred to the unbarred and pick up this M term, OK? And so um, I'll, I'm nearly finished, but I'll just sort of uh, tell you briefly the idea. Uh, and so I'll put some, I'll put some formulas on the board, so I'm sorry, but I'll try to point out which term, wh wh how the terms work. And there's one, there's one final conclusion about the, the structure that I wanted to make. Okay, so if, if we're going to use this, this, this formula, which I had before, so that says the, the H mean curvature is the Euclidean mean curvature plus some term, which is like X dot nu with a certain scaling factor, and here M is, as usual, this, this all-important quantity M, mass. And so, okay, here you just square this. Great. And so now, okay, I, uh, I didn't do anything except, so I've squared H. Then this quantity I said is negative. And in particular, you can write it exactly. It turns out to be the, using Gauss Bonnet and the Gauss equations, it's negative L2 norm of the trace free second fundamental form. Okay? So that, and that term will turn out to be important in a second. And so this term 
is going to tell us something about the inner radius. Okay, so this term has a sign. It's everything is squared. Okay, and so that means we can bound it from, if we put it on the other side, we can bound it from below. So it doesn't matter exactly. You should think of that as a good term. But the argument seems quite hopeless, because if you compute the size of this term, it seems really big. Okay. But you notice that this term would vanish if you knew the, the Euclidean mean curvature was constant. And that has something, to, and that has to do with the, right, if you delete that and get this here, then this is, you can use the divergence theorem to the inside. And this is exactly the thing who, which has Laplace in zero. Right, this is the, gra the gradient of the Green's function, but the is not inside of the surface. So there's no, there's no delta. You don't pick up a delta. That's where you're, you're far out. Okay. And so now what's funny is that in order to, to, to deal with the fact that this Euclidean mean curvature is not constant, you have to use this sort of sure type inequality. So the sure, like Schur's theorem says, for example, that if you have something whose uh, trace, whose second partial form has, ha, is pure, is, has a zero trace-free part, so it's pure trace, then the mean curvature is actually constant. Okay, so that's, that's this, this says something like this in L2, and they are these two terms play off of each other, and you can, you can complete the theorem. Yeah. Here? Yeah. In, in this, in, in, this is for the manifold. And so, yeah, I've suppressed some amount of, like, changing back and forth between Euclidean. Right. So I'll, st I'll stop there. Sorry if the end was a little technical. So, um, the, 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 in some sense, what happens is that, so you, you want to, so the problem is, so a stable CMC condition only feels things along the boundary, right? That, that says the mean curvature is constant in some integral, integral expression along the, only, I'll go back to the big, oh, now everyone's going to get sick. Right. So yeah. So so right, these two things, CMC and stable CMC, only feel the, the boundary. So if you don't assume something like asymptotically Schwarzschild, it turns out that there's these examples by uh, Carlotta and Shane, where in some piece of the manifold it's exactly flat, sort of in a half space, say. So then you can just just look over here, and you can be stable CMC uh, in this flat space, and you you don't feel the rest of the manifold at all. And so what, assuming, what the, the stronger assumption of asymptotically Schwarzschild does is it sort of smears out this, the, the thing that's going to help you. So the, the mass, which is what helps you, the m over r, is sort of everywhere, rather than, rather than just potentially in the half. So, so, so then if there's no m over r term, then the manifold is flat if you have non-negative scalar curvature. That's the positive mass there. So m over squared of r we don't know. So but m over r to the, the 1 half plus 0.1, whatever that is, right? So, so those, um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what happens here. Um, so we can say something, which is that if you're interested in the isoparametric problem, so you, assume a, you impose a stronger condition on your surface in exchange for a weaker condition on the metric. So if I ask not just what are the second order critical points, but what are the minimizers, okay? For the minimizers, then you can prove that going off like this, no matter what the metric is, this is bad for, the minim for, the, for what's the least area in closing that volume. And it turns out that the canonical foliation is indeed the minimizer, no matter what the metric does. But there could exist other critical points. Did that, that answer your question? Okay. 
So, so that, so for the result that I talked about at the very end, you don't, you don't use it. But it turns out that in, in this sort of result, so once you know that the inner radius and the mean curvature are comparable, then you can do sort of a Lyapunov-Schmidt, I don't know if you, you know what a Lyapunov-Schmidt reduction, you can sort of perturb off of Euclidean space in some sense. You know that this sphere is round, this sphere is CMC with respect to Euclidean, and then you say put this new metric which is nearly Euclidean, and how does that change the mean curvature? Let me do the best I can to, to account for that by wiggling the surface slightly. And then it turns out you can see what the effect of that is. And then you can say, can, is it possible to pick a sphere which then becomes exactly constant mean curvature? Okay. And so it turns out that when you say, is it possible, that has to do with a certain function that you can compute. And that function turns out to have, have effects from both the scalar curvature and the mass. Okay. And so by, by looking at those two things together, it turns out that you can see there's no real geometric, I don't think there's like a geometric way of seeing this, but just by computing this function, you can see that the scalar curvature could beat the mass term in a certain sense if it was allowed to sort of bump, do some bumps. It could like go like this, and that would allow large CMC spheres. 